It's time for Herd Mentality, the weekly episode where you control the discussion today on Locked on Bills. You are Locked on Bills, your daily Buffalo Bills podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Bills Mafia? It's Joe Marino, author of Go Bills and Buffalo's Run also the co-host of the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast, and I'm your host of Locked On Bills. want to thank you for making Locked On Bills your first listen every day, and a big welcome and shout-out to our everydayers. You know who you are, those of you who never miss a single episode. I appreciate y'all being here very, very much. I'd also like to invite you to subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team, every day. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. As playoffs wind down, the sports stop sporting like we want them to, but this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone, every day, all summer long. Just visit FanDuel.com to get started. Well, folks, welcome in. Tons of great herd mentality items to get to. Let's jump right in. First one comes from Lewis, who says, I have a question for herd mentality. Six of the Bills' eight captains from last season are no longer on the roster. Only Josh Allen and Von Miller are returning. Who do you predict will be the captains for the Bills this season? All right, so good question here, and I think it's a fun storyline to consider that the Bills have turned over a lot of the leadership of the football team in terms of captains, and I think there's some intentionality behind that. Obviously, the Bills made a choice to get younger and cheaper and reset a lot of positions on this roster. And so that opens the door for some new leaders. My predictions as to who the captains will be this season on offense, I have Josh Allen, which that's obvious. I think Deion Dawkins gets the C back on his jersey. He has been a captain in the past. Last year, he was not, but I think he's pretty much a lock to get one of those captain spots. The third one on offense is really fascinating. You could talk me into Connor McGovern. I feel like there's some momentum there, but I'm going to go with Dawson Knox as a experienced player, a veteran in this offense that I think players look to for guidance and you know certainly has a voice on this team. So offensively, Allen Dawkins and Knox. Defensively, Taron Johnson, I think it's his turn to get a C. Terrell Bernard as the middle linebacker and what he showed last year and the glimpses we've received in terms of how he communicates and how he takes charge. I feel like he's in line to be a captain. And then the third spot on defense is really fascinating. You could talk me into Von Miller, but I'm going to go with Daquan Jones, veteran defensive tackle. It feels like he's a guy that when I was, was observing training camp practices, he was very engaged in everything that was going on. Obviously an outstanding player and a veteran special teams. Mac Hollins, I think is, certainly trending in that direction. This was one of my predictions, you know, a few months ago, um, kind of being familiar with familiar with Matt Collins from his time at North Carolina. He's been a captain in the NFL before. And I think that um, he's in line to be a captain this year. And then the other special teams guy being Reed Ferguson. So Allen Dawkins, Knox, Taron Johnson, Terrell Bernard, Daquan Jones, Matt Collins, Reed Ferguson are my predictions. Matthew has a question that's pretty similar to one sent in by Drew. Matthew says, now that you have seen Keon Coleman in person running routes and catching balls from Josh Allen, how does you, your view of him differ now from when the Bills drafted him? Thanks, Joe, and go Bills. So I think you saw a lot of things that you would expect to see from Keon Coleman. And a guy that in five training camp practices that I observed, I see a guy that separates with catch radius and physicality, right? Those those skills at the catch point really show up, and obviously he's got good size, good ball skills, good hands, good body control, and just has a knack for creating that late separation and adjusting at the catch point. He's not a guy that necessarily creates separation with his route running and prevents this available target through creating space for the quarterback. I think what my time with the Bills last week brought to me was an appreciation for Josh Allen's appetite to throw the football to a wide receiver like Keon Coleman. 
And I think the big thing here is you have to accept that he's going to win in different ways than the primary pass catchers from Josh Allen over recent years, like a Stephon Diggs or a John Brown or a Cole Beasley or an Emmanuel Sanders. He's just a fundamentally different player. And so that's the adjustment that is necessary for Josh Allen is, hey, you're not going to have as much space to throw the football to. You know, Can you throw it to spots and develop that chemistry with the wide receiver and trust that he's going to make those plays with his ability to separate late into the route really right at the catch point upon arrival of the football. So I don't think I watched Keon Coleman this week and thought to myself, yeah, he's really coming along as a route runner and he can get open and run away from coverage. What I gained was an appreciation for his chemistry with Josh Allen and and how uh, there's a level of translatability that I feel more comfortable with uh, now than I did in the past. But, you know, we've we got a lot to – we got a long way to go here. We got to see some of that translate – from the practice field to games. You know, I've certainly come out of camp the last couple of years and really liked what I saw from Gabe Davis and felt like there was a growth there. And Josh Allen and him were on the same page. And then you get to the regular season and things are kind of hit or miss. So I'm curious to see how it all comes together. But my comfort level has certainly gone up after seeing this new piece of information, right, which is Keon Coleman with Josh Allen. It's no longer Keon Coleman at Florida State and projecting it's it's not the same anymore. There's new data. There's new sample size to consider, and I think it's trending in a good direction. Now, how does that show up in games? I'm fascinated to find out, and I still think, you know, Keon Coleman, I'd like to see him become a better route runner, and I, I mean, it's expected. I would, I would say that for pretty much any receiver in the NFL, especially a guy that's 21 years old that's a rookie, right? There's, there's room to develop, um, but how – he is connecting with Josh Allen is what's the most meaningful piece to me right now. Derek says, can we include cornerbacks to McDermott's resume with safeties? It seems like along with safety, he gets the best from cornerbacks, no matter what round or lifespan they come from. Also during the scrimmage, could you see who was calling the plays on defense? So let's start there. Every piece of information that I can gather suggests that Bobby Babich is calling the defense. I don't even see Sean McDermott with a headset on in any of the practices that I watched. And so it definitely feels like Bobby Babich has given been given every opportunity to call the plays during practices, and there is not a single piece of information that suggests that it's Sean McDermott. Again, he does not have a headset on. He's very much behind the play CEO type style where Bobby Babich is in the weeds. He's got the walkie-talkie. He's the one doing all of that. He's orchestrating the defense. So that's where all the momentum feels in my mind. The other part of this question from Derek was about Sean McDermott's resume with cornerbacks. And I certainly applaud Sean McDermott all the time for his resume with safeties because it's off the charts. I've went through that inventory several times. But I think Derek brings up a tremendous point. It extends to corners. It's almost like Sean McDermott is a DB whisperer. I think it's fair to call him that. Go back to the Philadelphia Eagles and his time there. Lito Shepard, Sheldon Brown, Asante Samuel, big-time players for him. And and Asante Samuel was a name before he got to Philadelphia, but his best years in the NFL came with Sean McDermott and the Eagles. But Lito Shepard, Sheldon Brown, outstanding players. With the Panthers, developing guys like Josh Norman, who was a a fifth-round pick and turned into one of the best corners in the league. Captain Munerlin, a very intriguing inside outside player um kind of a foundational guy in this conversation of base nickel defense you know he was one of the first slot corners that did kind of the stuff Taron Johnson does James Bradbury Daryl Worley Daryl Worley is another good one where that guy's bounced around and had a lot of opportunity but he only ever played good when he was with Sean McDermott then you go to the Bills and Trey White and Levi Wallace as a UDFA and Levi Wallace has played his best football with Sean McDermott Dane Jackson is a seventh round pick and becoming a nice depth player that's going to get a chance to start with Carolina. Christian Benford, right? What we've seen there. Taron Johnson, he gets credit there. And then I, I love that Derek brought up in his in his uh, question that it doesn't matter what round or lifespan. And we certainly, in the list of corners that I just went through, I gave you a first rounder like Trey White, but also a late rounder like a Josh Norman or a Christian Benford. But he's also done very well with like late stage corners. Drayton Flores, Chris Gamble, 
Charles Tillman, Kevin Johnson. He's gotten a lot out of those players as well. So, you know, you can have your criticisms for Sean McDermott. That's fine. You can't extend any criticism to him for his ability to develop and get production out of defensive backs, no matter if they're first round picks, late round picks, late in their career, hasn't done anything in their career, and then all of a sudden show up with Sean McDermott and they play great ball. Sean McDermott's resume working with defensive backs is simply off the charts. All right, folks, coming up on the other side of it, some really good questions about roster decisions. We're going to talk about that in addition to some no huddle conversation and more. So be sure to stick with me. I love sports. I love them so much. I never want them to stop. But as the playoffs wind down, we get fewer games and the sports aren't sportsing like I want them to. But FanDuel lets me keep the sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open the app and dream up bets anytime that I'm in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a booster bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. You just got to head on over to FanDuel.com. They have football's futures bets. That's what I've been really enjoying, whether it's the uh, projected over-under for win totals, award odds for you know MVP or Defensive Rookie of the Year. They've also got stat projections where you can hit the over-under team special. So much fun. Check it out. Head on over to FanDuel.com and start making the most of your summer. FanDuel, the official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. All right, let's keep it moving here. The next one comes from Michael, who says, with how diverse the offensive pieces can get with different players being able to do different roles, could you see at some point the Bills lean into some no huddle to catch defenses in a look and exploit it? I've recently gone back and watched some of the 90s teams and seeing how they were able to take advantage of defensive personnel has me thinking. It's a good question here, Michael. And let me start by saying something that might surprise some people. And it's that last season, the Bills were one of the most frequent teams that used no huddle. 12.9% of the time last year, the Bills used no huddle. Eighth in the NFL. That's pretty, I mean, it's top, that's the top 25% of the league. And like number, they're 0.5% away from being fifth. So a very common team when it comes to no huddle. Now, what was also interesting in researching the data to answer this question is that there is no correlation whatsoever between good offenses in the NFL and no huddle frequency. You see really good offenses at the top of the list. You see great offenses at the bottom of the list. Teams like San Francisco, Miami, Detroit, those are all teams towards the bottom of the list, and they're very good on offense. Kansas City, very low frequency of no huddle. No huddle. So, I thought that was kind of interesting. Now, that said, I think the Bills can use tempo and no huddle to their advantage. And I think, to your point, Michael, it's rooted in the versatility of the offensive skill sets. Uh, the personnel groupings that the Bills can put on the field can dictate and influence how defenses counter them. And because of the versatility the Bills have in offensive skill players, it can put defenses in a bind. When you have running backs that can play wide receiver. And, Ty, I mean, it's it's not just James Cook. You can flex out a Ray Davis and, and put him at wide receiver as well. You got tight ends that can play in the slot. I mean, literally any of the Bills' top four tight ends, you feel comfortable playing slot receiver. Then you have wide receivers that can play in the backfield like a Curtis Samuel, but also the size that the Bills have at wide receiver in a guy like Mac Hollins and Keon Coleman, those guys can become insert blockers in the run game. And so you can really dictate so much based on your personnel, and you might have you know, 21 personnel on the field and go empty. And you got two running backs and a tight end on the field. That's going to tell defenses to put bigger people, right? They could go base four, three, three linebackers. And now you go empty and they're going to have problems. You stay in that. And all of a sudden you're a heavy set and you're able to pound the rock. You can do so many different things uh, with this offensive personnel. So I think that's part of the part of the appeal and part of the makeup of what this Bills offense wants to be. Maybe it's not about one guy funneling everything through them, but because of all they can bring to the table, it can create some challenges in terms of matchups for the defense. Mike says, curious if keeping five wide receivers is on par with other teams in the league. Seems low to me. Would seem that this year more might be better with a committee-like approach, new kickoff rules, etc. So, I did a little research here for you. In 2023, 
the NFL averaged 5.9 wide receivers per team on the active roster, 5.9. So obviously it's not uncommon to roster five wide receivers. Uh, the only way you can get to an, an average of 5.9 is if several teams do roster only five. It's, it's actually pretty common. And of course, the Bills were part of those teams. This is kind of a forgotten thing. The Bills only rostered five wide receivers last year. That's it. Diggs, Davis, Shakir, Hardy, Sherfield. That's it. They did not roster six. And with the emphasis on 12 personnel, and really before Dawson Knox got hurt, it was like 45% of the Bills' snaps were out of 12 personnel, which kind of takes away from your necessity to have six or seven receivers. I remember in years where the Bills under Brian Dayball led the NFL in 10 personnel, which is four wide receiver sets, they never kept seven. And we always talked, well, is this the year they keep seven? Is this the year they keep seven? Well, now that the Bills have become more of a 12 personnel team, not only did they not keep seven, they don't even keep six. They kept five last year. And so I think that's part of us calibrating our expectations appropriately for who the Bills are going to roster is being mindful of that possibility that they could only roster five. And when you talk about the committee approach, I think that's true, but you can still achieve that with five because part of your committee approach is the utilization of tight ends and running backs, which creates less of a demand for wide receivers. And as you kind of sort this out and the follow-up questions here are going to allow me to get into some other pieces of this conversation, but the Bills' top four receivers to me are Shakir, Coleman, Samuel, and Hollins. I think that's set in stone. And then you got to figure out from there, if you go five, is it Tyrell Shavers? Is it Marquez Valdez-Scantling? Is the X factor in this entire conversation, if Andy Isabella or KJ Hamler winds up being your punt returner, and now you go a little heavy at wide receiver to fill that role, but then you know, you can't go heavy everywhere. That's the point that I keep making. You can't keep six receivers and 10 offensive linemen and 10 defensive linemen and five safeties. And you got to, you have to make concessions somewhere. And it feels like wide receiver makes a lot of sense because I feel like some of those other spots pr bring more value with who the fifth or the sixth guy would be at wide receiver. You know, I think your ninth or 10th uh, defensive lineman probably offers more to your football team. So I would, I would say prepare yourself for five wide receivers, maybe six, and definitely not seven. Next one here comes from Steven, who says, what would you do with the following options? Six wide receivers, four tight ends, 10 offensive linemen, nine to 10 defensive linemen. Which position group do you prioritize given the talent on the roster? Would you consider cutting, cutting Gilliam to get an extra spot elsewhere? Let me save the Gilliam piece of that for the next question. But in this overall conversation, to me, I am 1 million percent prioritizing the defensive line. I think this is where the hardest conversations are. I would think the Bills will keep 10. Now, is that six edges in four interior guys? Is it five and five? We'll find out. But when you start talking about cutting defensive linemen, you're thinking about guys like Deshaun Williams. Javon Solomon, Kingsley Jonathan. You know, I I, I want to keep those guys. Those guys mean more to me than Justin Shorter or, I mean, respectfully, Tyrell Shavers. Like, those guys matter so much. The Bills rotate those defensive linemen, and having that depth means so much. Having fresh bodies, you know, guys with upside on the defensive line, I think that's clearly where you should go heavy with with roster personnel. And so in this conversation of what you should prioritize in terms of going heavy, to me, it's defensive line all day long. And then from there, it's probably offensive line where we're having conversations about keeping, well, do they keep Tylen Grable or do they keep Will Clapp? Well, I'd like to keep both. I want the veteran interior player and I want the young toolsy tackle, right? I, I want, I want those things. I'm not as concerned about a fourth tight end. I want to keep those types of players. So the trenches leaning towards the defensive line, then the offensive line. Jennifer says, by all accounts, Zach Davidson is having a great camp and he plays special teams. Is there any way the Bills could keep four tight ends? Go Bills. Well, let's not forget that Quentin Morris is also having a great camp and he plays special teams and actually has a proven resume of special teams in the NFL. So I think that's important, right? So for we can get excited about Zach Davidson, but don't forget that, like, Quentin Morris is no slouch as tight end three. 
And I am excited about Zach Davidson. I think he's forced these types of conversations with what he's done in camp. He's definitely popped. But I do think four tight ends is a tough sell. And that's part of why I said with Steven's question that I would table the Reggie Gilliam piece of that question because I think if you do roster four tight ends, it's either a fourth tight end or Reggie Gilliam. I think that's where you have to make a concession. I don't think you can keep a fourth tight end and Reggie Gilliam. And so what's what do you want more? Do you want it's literally do you want Zach Davidson or do you want Reggie Gilliam? Both play special teams, but Reggie Gilliam has an actual resume of special teams in the NFL. You have three other good tight ends. You don't have you would not have a fullback in the situation. And I understand the Bills don't use a fullback a ton, but you you probably want that player plus the special teams, unless you do feel like you're gonna dress a Quentin Morris and he can fill that role as a fullback. So I think you're to make this very practical, it's Zach Davidson or Reggie Gilliam. And then the consequence of whichever direction you go. I think that's what it comes down to. All right, folks, coming up on the other side of it, a little check-in on some UDFAs and more. So be sure to stick with me. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. When your schedule is packed with kids' activities, big work projects, and more, it's easy to let your priorities slip. Even when we know what makes us happy, it's hard to make time for it. But when you feel like you have no time for yourself, non-negotiables like therapy are more important than ever. Therapy is helpful for learning positive coping skills and how to set boundaries. It empowers you to be the best version of yourself. It's not just for people who have experienced major trauma. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to, to your schedule. All you do is fill out a brief questionnaire. That'll get you matched with a licensed therapist. You can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Never skip therapy day with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOn today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOn. All right, folks. Next one here comes from Mike. Mike says, who would be some UDFAs that you could see having a decent shot at making this roster? Did any stand out to you at practice? It's a good question, and when you look at this year's batch, I think there's probably only two that even have a small case. Now, there's UDFAs from previous years that I think could make this roster, and, and that's happened, right? Reggie Gilliam, Quentin Morris, Jamarcus Ingram, Cam Lewis, Tyrell Shavers. There's plenty of those types of guys that I think will make the roster, but from this year's batch of UDFAs, I think the two that make the most sense are Frank Gore and to Corey Couch. Uh, Frank Gore, running back, and really what this comes down to is what is Ty Johnson's situation with the hamstring? Because if Ty Johnson's ready to go, then I think he stiff arms anybody else at running back because I think the Bills would like their trio of backs to be Cook, Davis, and Johnson. So if there's something wrong with Ty Johnson that prevents him from making the initial 53 where he's on injured reserve. Don't feel like that's the case. And Frank Gore can beat out Darrington Evans. I think Frank Gore Jr. has a reasonable chance. Again, I think he'll need some help. The other player is to Corey Couch, slot corner out of Miami. I still think this is a long shot because the Bills' slot depth is looking better and better when you already have a Cam Lewis and you're seeing what Daquan Hardy is able to do. Jamarcus Ingram has had some good reps from the slot as well. But to Corey Couch, as a player that uh, has had a lot of experience at Miami and his last two seasons at Miami came playing under Jamil Adai, who's the Bills' new corner coach, I think that helps him quite a bit but I still think he would need some help. But I do feel like the two that I thought were the best in camp practices were Frank Gore and to Corey Couch, although I don't, I'm, I would not predict either to make this roster. You know, Jack Browning had a chance to beat out Sam Martin, but obviously that competition is over. And I think if you watch the camp practices, that was pretty clear that Sam Martin was far by far the more consistent punter. And then I think, you know, Gable Steveson is worth talking about here. Um, but I think, I find it hard to believe that Gable Steveson is going to show enough right now that you're going to keep a, keep him on the roster over a Deshaun Williams. Um, 
I think he's a player you'd love to stash on the practice squad all season long and then really reassess where he's at next year at this time in terms of if there's a real path for him to make this roster. So I don't think any of them do. I was most impressed with Frank Gore and to Corey Couch. Um, but obviously things can can change fast in the NFL and we'll we'll see how injuries can influence a lot of these conversations. John says, is Josh Allen already the greatest triple threat quarterback in NFL history? Is there any chance of seeing him catch another touchdown anytime soon? So, I mean, Josh Allen has certainly had some ch- chances to catch a football, but I, I'm, not, I'm not sure it's as frequent as most people think. He's been targeted three times in his career, including the playoffs, and he has two catches. Now, he did score two touchdowns on, two, on those two catches, but it's not like this is a, a regular thing that he does. Um, he's not been targeted in the, in the last three seasons. So I will predict that Josh Allen will not catch a pass this season. I will say this, and I can only disclose so much. I did observe a play at training camp where Josh Allen did not throw a pass, but he was the quarterback on the field, and he was not the receiver. So um, never say never. I'm sure the Bills, if they were to practice those types of things, would do it in a closed session where the public is not at practice, and there's certainly going to be a lot of those practices. But I will predict that Josh Allen does not receive any targets in 2024. And I, I don't know. that It's fun to talk about the triple threat, right? Like, does any any quarterback really have receiving production? I mean, like Cordell Stewart. I think I looked it up. Like, Drew Brees has eight catches, but he obviously he doesn't run the ball. So, I don't know. It, it's a fun topic, but I don't think any quarterback would have enough meaningful, you know, enough meaningful data across three categories or be good enough in any one that makes you overlook lacking in other areas. Not that I'm expecting a quarterback to be like frequently targeted, but if you, I think if you have like eight, nine, 10 career catches as a quarterback, that was a starter, you know, not just like a, a gadget player. Like um, you, you think about players in the past, like Brad Smith, right? The bills had Brad Smith. Was he really a quarterback? You have to think about those types of guys, but Anyways, I don't think Josh Allen's going to catch a pass this year. Next one is from Buff Bills, who says, as Josh Allen progresses in his career, what kind of body changes, dietary changes would you like to see from him in order to keep or change his style of play? You have to assume this is on the minds of the Bills front office as well. Well, I mean, I'll answer the question. I'll, I'll start by saying this, is that as he ages, I think he will have to adjust his style of play, right? I think he'll have to win more with his brain, win more from the pocket, be less reliant on uh, winning outside of structure. I don't think we're anywhere near near being concerned with that. But, I mean, if Josh Allen's going to push 40 years old or or exceed 40 years old as a starting quarterback in the NFL, I mean, he'll have to change his style a little bit, which is going to be more mental, more winning from the pocket, right? I think that's the conversation you would have pretty much regarding any quarterback as they age, especially one that's stylistically like Josh Allen. It's not like Tom Brady. Tom Brady was a guy that was going to sit in the pocket and throw the football, never won off script, and I think it was easier for a guy like that to age. But you've also seen players like a Matthew Stafford age pretty gracefully as well, and I think you know that's a player that you would look at. And you know that Matthew Stafford was never quite the runner that Josh Allen was, but when you think about big arm and and being able to rely on arm talent, and even Aaron Rodgers is a player that I think ran a lot more earlier in his career. You can look at some guys that are, are getting up there in age and, and see um, how they were able to age and, and how Josh Allen can fall in line. But I will say this. I think Josh Allen looks great physically. I think he's as in shape as we've ever seen him, especially in the spring. I thought that really stood out when you saw him coming in for OTAs during the spring. Josh Allen looked pretty trim. There wasn't a whole lot of fluff on the guy. And um I'm encouraged with that. I, I think it's fair to recognize that he has every resource at his disposal to optimally eat and train. He's been the most durable quarterback in the NFL by far. And I, I mean, things will evolve as he ages, but I, I can't sit here and act like I have all the information to really get on, get in on specifics on what he needs to change in terms of nutrition and diet, other than acknowledging that he has all the resources, other than acknowledging that things will evolve as he ages. And I think there's a good story to tell based on his durability. Now, I think you can also listen to some of the things that Josh Allen has said in the past and be a little bit concerned about, you know, where he's at with those types of things. But, you know, I I think that Josh Allen's offseason is a little bit 
of an unknown. Like we know that he likes to travel and hang out with his girlfriend and he likes to play golf and, and hang out with his buddies and drink whiskey and do those types of things, which is fine. But like, I think sometimes we can put ourselves in a position where you assume that other things aren't happening, like training, like, you know, working on pliability and what he, what he puts into his body. Right. Like I, I don't, just because you don't know what those things are, doesn't mean that they're not happening, but I think you can look at the results on the field for Josh Allen and recognize that, yeah, a lot of whatever he's doing is working. He, I think he's the second best player in the NFL. You know, by anybody's measurement that matters, I think you would say he's he's certainly a top ten player in the league. So, you know, I think there's there's, I mean, he's entering what year is this year seven? I think there's there's enough consistent success for you to understand that, you know, Josh Allen is doing really good things to produce at a high level. You know, maybe you could say there's meat on the bone, but does anybody really have the specifics? I know I've said that I'm concerned about those things, and I, I, I'm not, I'm not backing off on those stance. Like I, I do think that it's going to be important for Josh Allen to play at a high level. You know, into his late 30s, I do think that he'll have to make those adjustments. But uh, I don't know exactly where he's at. I don't know what he's eating. I don't know how he's training. But I think you can look at the results and feel pretty good about a lot of what he's doing. And he'll have to evolve as he ages just like every one of us do does right as you age you have to make certain changes to uh, be able to function the way that you want to and if you don't you're you're just gonna become stiff and fluffy right you don't want that uh so you know look josh allen has every resource at his disposal to do all the right things he knows what's on the line right is a franchise quarterback for the bills and what he means to the city and you know jobs that are on the line based on his ability to produce so um, we'll see how it plays out, but it's hard for me to get overly specific on exactly what would need to evolve or change. All right, folks, that's going to do it for us here today on the podcast. Very excited for the rest of this week. Obviously, we got a preseason game on Saturday against the Chicago Bears, but some other topics that I want to get into, some very specific things the rest of the week, talking about maybe some uh, buzzy players, controversial players on the Bills. Don't miss anything, folks. Be sure to make sure that you are subscribed. We'd love it if you took a second to rate, review, and share the podcast. Have a great rest of your day. Go Bills, and I look forward to catching up with you again real soon.